I like the excitement, you know. I like, you know, adventure, you know, I'm the kind of person to go after excitement, you know, danger. Please, freeze! Please. Go, go, go! Freeze! Let's see your hands! Please! Get your hands up! Hands up! Get up. Let's go, both Get of you. Up. Turn around, hands against the wall. Keep them up! Keep that hand right there, don't move it. Hands up. Lay it down. Huh? Okay. Hey, send one of the patrolmen in here, Greg. Just keep your hands up. And we send a patrolman in here. Who's out on the street selling drugs? Who's getting shot and killed? Who are the gang wars between? The drug wars between? It's between the young youngsters. Okay, so how do you feel about this? It's the way of life for most people. You know, they grow up selling marijuana and weed and stuff. That's how they make their money. It's cool, man. Everybody else is doing it. It's cool if you get in there and you're just like them. People who 15, 14, and 13, they can't get no jobs, you know. It's a quick way to make money. That's how I see it. Nobody wants to work making no minimum wage. That's not, no, that's not any money at all. 335, when they can go out there and sell drugs and make fast money. Make a thousand a day. That looks like about an ounce of cocaine we got on a plate there. $12,000 worth of coke just on a plate like that, you know, and that's good money. And it's fast money. Everyone agrees it's the easy drug money that leads to scenes like this. Oakland police barge into a home and arrest young people in the throes of the illegal drug business. Thousands of teenagers and younger children are so thoroughly involved in using or dealing drugs that in some areas an entire generation is endangered. Their whole life, you know, evolved around violence and, you know, selling drugs and making money and stuff, you know. 17-year-old convicted drug dealers serving time in Alameda County talk freely about their lives on the condition they remain anonymous to avoid any possible reprisals. For life on the streets of Oakland can be dangerous. I think it was possible that I could have got killed, you know, being a mistake for somebody else or... Um, or like you were saying about turf wars and stuff like that, you know. It, it For two youngsters, possible. we'll call them William and John. The danger is part of the lure. John tells of smoking dope at age 10 and selling at 12. I mean, it was kind of fun, me, dodging bullets and stuff. It was like something that I never thought would happen to me. It was something like, it was like, I can't believe it, man. I almost got shot. For kids, the thrills of the drug life and the big profits to be made off the street value of cocaine, marijuana, and heroin shine brightly amidst the... I mean, because every day I can wake up, you know, I know what I'm going to do. I know how my day is going to end up, you know. I'm going to wake up and get washed up and stuff and uh, go out, go straight to a little restaurant or a cafe right there on the corner, get me some breakfast, and just get out there, you know, and get busy, start selling dope. I was making enough money to recop and, and have fun, you know, get high every night and go places and buy little things, you know. Like a dope fiend come up to me with a gold ring, I can be able to buy it, you know, for about $10 or $15. It ain't nothing. As soon as I get out of school, I used to just go sell drugs and, and be with the people who were selling drugs around me, like my friends and stuff. And we used to talk and sell drugs and run for the police occasionally and stuff like that and, you know, laugh about it, you know. I see it all the time. I mean, I see guys hanging out. I see them making drug deals on the side of my store. Jim Copes is trying to raise a young family and run a business in East Oakland. But he's having a hard time and he worries about the future. I want to know, do you love me? Drugs are all around him. How much do you love me? Unlike many residents, he complains openly and pays the consequences. There's some kids riding their bike in and out and they were sending, like you and I sitting here talking, they were passing drugs back and forth and money and the kids are riding a bicycle right underneath him. And I said, this is the end, of the, end of the end of the road. I can't deal with this anymore. So I called the police, surprised them. And they searched him and everything. And uh, next thing I know, 
I was talking to one of the guys over there a few weeks, uh, no, two days later approximately, and man, uh, we got into it, the guy started, one guy started chasing me, the other guy tripped me, hit me with a two by eight, and they said because I was a fink. So SDU, two guys, SDU, one guy, it's all got your shotguns, right? Oakland police are vigorously attacking the kind of drug dealing Jim Cobbs complains of, street dealing. They do it full time, trying to find out where drugs are being sold outdoors. Then, as officers wait in unmarked cars in the neighborhood, an undercover cop buys some dope and immediately calls in the others to catch the sellers. It seems like a lot of work and a lot of police to arrest small-time marijuana dealers. But the process is repeated over and over, and it has made a difference. It appears it moved a lot of it inside. It's made them a lot more cautious. You don't see the numbers of kids on the corner song that you used to see. This comes, Mike, could you just go with him? Yeah. Yeah. How'd it go with me, man? That, does. that ain't my car. But the police can only move the dealing indoors or somewhere else. These raids, while effective in making sales riskier, probably have little lasting effect, and certainly not much impact on the values of the young. I don't care that they take every police officer from every state and country, they will not, you know, they will not stop drugs. It's part of their program and they life. Every day they wake up, I said, well, we're going to go over to her house and get high and do this, or we're going to do that today, you know. I started smoking weed when I was in the fourth grade. It wasn't no big deal. I just smoked weed every day. You know? Every day? And I still smoke weed every day. I used to smoke weed before I went to school in the morning, mm -hmm. but I had to stop that because when you can't smoke weed when you're on your way to school because you can't comprehend to what the teacher's saying, you be in your own world. So I smoke weed like after school or late at night. Let's go That's, to sleep. Yeah. yeah. On the front porch of the home next to Jim Cope's store, three young women, none of them yet graduated from high school, passed the time. Everybody into cocaine nowadays, because there's so many base heads out here. You know, people that smoke through the base pipe. And um, that's why everybody's starting to sell cocaine now. If I was to smoke, take a hit off coke, and then my eyes would get real big. My heart would be beating fast, and I'll be looking on the ground. All these Everything white specks I would think was cocaine. Mm -hmm. See, weed don't make you tweak. Weed don't make you be up with your eyes like this, wanting another hit like Coke does. They just tweak out, just like my friend. He killed this girl, and it was so bad that, you know, they were smoking, they were smoking on a pipe, and they killed her and threw her body in the closet. And, you know, wait till they finished smoking to call an ambulance for her and all that. Coke dealers, they like, they point out girls down the street and tell me, you know, what she done did just to get a little $20 rock, you know. She would be having sex with dogs or she would have sex with five or six men, you know, just for a $20 rock. And I think if they, you know, come to jail or something, or, you know, something that's going to teach them a lesson, you know, not to go back and do it again, you know, that would probably be the only thing, but, um... A lot of people still don't see it that way, you know, because, like, I got peers up here, you know, who is just waiting to get back out and do the same thing over again, you know. Remain seated and come to order. Court's now in session. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. In juvenile court, Judge Wilmot Sweeney must decide how to treat young drug dealers. You know, they come in and they look like kids, by golly, and they're accused of all these things. And if you don't know it, if you haven't read the record, no he's just like anybody else's little teenager. Case. He admitted the sale of cocaine to the court and the violation of probation. <clears throat> Sweeney presides over an increasing number of cases where teenagers are accused of selling hard drugs. Here, a young man was caught selling cocaine while on probation for a previous drug violation. I would ask the court to give the minor a chance to show the court that he will do well on probation. I believe that the minor is motivated, and I believe that his stay in custody, some 38 days, has taught him a very, very valuable lesson. While he was on probation, he may have been completing his weekend training academy, but he was flunking the course out on the street. 
Sweeney also finds that it's hard to reason with young drug offenders. Nothing seems to impress them other than the threat of jail. The lack of morality that's displayed by them and the, the fact that they don't even see things the way the rest of us see things, that's shocking uh, and it's scary. Uh, we've got to do something about it. Uh, uh, my basic concern is this is two times in a row and in a very short time. I mean, a very short time. He comes in on, and there's one drug finding and he turns around and he does another one. Bam. It's, it's telling the court to go to hell. Probation report indicates that the mother has a cocaine problem herself. I almost felt like crying. I hope you didn't see that in there. At least I hope he didn't see that. This kid's mother is on cocaine. They are, it's, it's clear that he's using his cocaine sales to help support the family. But what in the world do you do, you do when those kinds of pressures are being put on a 16-year-old kid? You can't say, don't love your mother, son. Of course he's going to love his mother. I've got to consider taking him out of the home and placing him somewhere else. All right, now, James, I'm ordering you to camp. And if you come back with drugs, I've got to escalate. That means I've got to get tougher. And the tough, next highest place is California Youth Authority. You don't want that. Tough is one of my A things. Uh, I take the view uh, to the kid. Uh, you've told everybody to go to hell up to me. If you'd been listening to your mother in the first place, you never would have gotten into any trouble. If you'd listened to the cop on the beat, you never would have gotten into trouble. If you'd listened to your school teacher, you never would have gotten into trouble. And finally, you're here dealing with me. I am the last step. You will not tell me to go to hell and get away with it. Hold on a second. Judge Sweeney isn't at all sure that the punishment he imposes will change the behavior of drug dealers. But the law gives him very few tools to work with, and he doesn't want to simply give up. Finally, we're asking that the court order the minor to pay $100 as a restitution fine to... We've got to say that something can be done at this level. And I'm, I insist that we try hard to do that. What frustrates Judge Sweeney is that from the bench, he is powerless to change the environment in which drugs and violence flourish. Neighborhoods that may not look like the tenement-ridden ghettos of the East Coast, but where single-parent families are the rule and poverty pervades. Ava Washington has lived in East Oakland in a housing project 14 years. Her friend Mary Martin has been here almost as long. Not too many years ago, they were teenagers. Today, they are bringing up their own children. We're in a, what you would call a ghetto area. We are living in city-owned housing. The drugs is here. We can't hide that the drugs is here. And um, I have seen some younger ones, nine-year-old, getting high. A lot of people that do what? There's a lot of little kids that be doing that stuff. Little kids doing it? Yeah, yeah. about like yeah. 13, With 12. Adults. No, what? Yeah, Bobby said you were 12. 12, 12. doing that. In a, any level. Well, you've seen kids smoking? Yup, yeah. I've seen some at um, over by the store. I seen some. And, um, and I seen this boy, he was smoking it. But nobody here, of course. No, no, no. But it's more than smoking dope that disturbs Ava Washington. She is ready to quit her job so she can stay home because of the violence, the shooting, that is all too close. Her 17-year-old boy had a close call recently when he borrowed her car. I got a bullet hole in my car now. Why? Drugs involved? And I'm not going to lie, it's drugs. It's drug related and then again it's this peer pressure thing and who gonna outdo each other, you know, what projects is the baddest, you know, because they come through here right now, like we sitting out here, and they've been coming through here like once a week, and the boys that's playing over there at the basketball court, they just start shooting, don't care who they shooting at, they just begin to miss firing. Yeah, there be a lot of shooting around sometimes, here. Sometimes, it be at night time, somebody, two times, be in the daytime, people be playing, but if I hear it is right by me, if it's right by me, I'll run, but if it ain't, I just, Last week they came out here firing guns and all my children, all my children was out there, five and six year old, you know, and I'm at home. I have to call my son, hey, get them home before they get shot. And I mean, they be shooting for real bullets and guns out here. Sounds like you liked it. I mean, I did, man. I, I, I like the excitement, you know. I like, you know, adventure, you know, any kind of person go after excitement, you know, danger.
You, you know, can get kinda, killed, though. I know that, but I was scared of dying, right? When you come close to dying, you know, it's even fun. There's been times that I didn't came that close to death and laughed about it the same night, a couple hours after it happened, just laughed about it. There is the constant adrenaline rush. And I think that's why the street life is so hard. Uh, it's so hard just to seduce someone away from it because it, that's where the excitement is. What do you offer in exchange for that eight to five on a job? Joanna Henry supervises young offenders at the Los Cerros camp and in the streets of Oakland. She's been a juvenile probation officer for 20 years. Yep. Like Judge Sweeney, she uses the threat of arrest and of confinement to try to change the behavior of her wards. She finds it nearly impossible to convince them there's anything wrong with drug dealing. It's going to cost you your freedom, eventually. Very good chance it could cost you your life. She is pessimistic that her work will have any permanent effect. It's very clear I have to stop his dealing by taking him through the court process and getting him off the streets. Now, whether that solves the problem in a larger context, I don't think it does because his warm spot on the sidewalk is filled probably before our court process is finished. And what it does for this person as an individual, does it turn him around, does it change him? I would say in general, no. It stops him for the time that we've got him. From her experience, Joanna Henry believes that children who live amidst drugs and violence must be educated and diverted early if they are to have any chance of escaping from the prevailing life. By the time a child reaches high school, it may be too late. Put your cigarette out. You don't smoke in front of school. At Castle Mott High in East Oakland, Vice Principal Carol Evans has plenty to do, just getting kids to class and not disrupting the school. Put it out. Do you think it would be appropriate to have some kind of a, a drug education program more than just in a few science classes? Sure. Here. Sure. Uh, why isn't there? Well, uh, at this point, that isn't, you know, that's not our number one focus. No counseling programs or nothing like that, you know, just same, you know, hear the same thing coming from the adults, you know, that selling them drugs ain't gonna get you nowhere, you know, hearing that all day, you know, from grown-ups that then, you know, then been there or live the same life or something, you know. So you don't, you discount it? You don't believe it? Uh, um, now I believe it, you know, but right then, you know, I didn't never listen to him, you know, just being hard at it, you know, thinking you know everything, that's all. In a different setting, an alternative high school called the Street Academy, which attracts students who have had a hard time adjusting to regular schools, drugs are openly discussed with some regularity. People who cannot respect things and go overboard on certain things, they're called abusers. You do too much of something, what are you doing? You're abusing it. You drink a few beers too many, you're abusing it because you can't walk straight, you can't talk right, you smoke a few joints too many, if it's, you know, it's heavy stuff, you know, your mind is, you know, the perception's not going to be there. But, you know, when you go out in the streets, it's hard because it's all over. I mean, everywhere you go, ain't no place where you go and people don't do drugs or at least smoke weed. Uh, not me, personally, but I have seen people who smoke weed in front of their parents. While the Street Academy, with its small classes and involved staff, may turn some high school students on to school and away from drugs, most experts agree that by the time a youngster reaches high school, even if he is active in sports or other after-school activities, the die is cast. But in Oakland, programs for younger children are scarce as well, though some exist. Someone came up to me and asked me to sell drugs, but I said no. Street Smarts, in its first year, is a carefully crafted curriculum designed to teach elementary school children how to deal with crime, drugs, and violence. Toward the end of the instruction block, uniformed police officers run one class. Do you think that drug sales are going to stop because one person says no? Do you think so? Because you refuse to do it. Okay, you've only done what? You've only taken care of part of the problem. Does this approach keep kids on the straight and narrow as they enter their teens? Nobody knows. The cops in the program come from Oakland's Youth Services Division. Men and women who patrol the city, especially during school hours, checking for truants and troublemakers around the schools. It's a different approach than they use in the classroom. Where do you go to school, Eugene? Right here. At Oakland, do you have a good reason to be out? We go to work. Okay. 
As a safety measure, the schools encourage a visible police presence around their campuses. But the effect of all those cops is only temporary. Occasionally, the juvenile cops are invited to talk about drugs with slightly older children, but it's rare. At Elmhurst Middle School, state money was supposed to be spent in a pilot drug education program, but little was done. The program barely got off the ground. And so, when Governor Duke Majin came to inspect, these youngsters got their first taste of a drug lecture. I want you to know what this is. They take these rocks, they put them up here on top of a little, little screen. Put the subject rock. was the latest craze in drug uh, use, the base here. pipe for smoking nice rock lighter, cocaine. And they light those rocks up and smoke it. They draw it right through here and smoke it. Now what happened to Richard Pryor, he was doing that. For the governor, this graphic drug lesson was an eye-opener. But for many of the 11 to 13-year-olds, only the fact that they were hearing about it in school was new. You know about our three major drug dealers that we had in Oakland here, and all three of them are in jail now. And, uh, and one of them is, is gone for the rest of his life, another one for 25 years. One of the reasons that, that drug education programs are rare class, is that school administrators in Oakland seldom admit publicly that their school has a drug problem. And, and you say there is no we, drug dealing we, in this school? No. We, don't have, we haven't had any students arrested at this school. I have not seen as much drug usage here as I have at other schools that I've worked in. It has not been prevalent here. Any principal that stands up and says, I don't have a drug problem, I don't think it's telling the truth. I've been a, been a principal in every school I've been in, there has been these problems seeping in. We know for a fact children who are selling drugs in schools and, you know, because they've admitted it to us. We call the, the counselor or the, the assistant principal the principal. And the principal says, oh, not on our campus. No, we had that problem several years ago, but we've cleaned it up. And you know, Naeem Shabazz is, is a counselor at the Scotland Family Therapy Center in West Oakland. In dealing with troubled youngsters and their parents, he finds they often deny obvious drug problems. Oh, the harm in denial is that the, parent, the child will continue that, to, to, to get away with it. And uh, that's where... When he, if he can get away with it longer and longer and longer, the, the more, the stronger his urge and his, his uh, dependency for that drug, whatever it happens to be, uh, is. And then, you know, there's no telling what will happen after that. How do you avoid drug dependency? You just say no to all drugs from a very early age. That's the guiding principle behind the Just Say No clubs. They try to help by providing diversion, like this Saturday morning bowling session. Elementary and middle school children also have meetings during school hours to discuss how they can just say no to drugs. But the program is small, it operates in just 15 schools, and its membership is surprisingly limited. Well, we really don't take children who have drug problems. We don't want them. So many kids in the ghetto area, they don't feel good about themselves, you know. I'm poor, I'm deprived, I don't have, I'm not like other kids, and this makes a great difference. You know, you teach a child at a young age to feel good about yourself. You're important. You're somebody, you know. That's the philosophy at this youth center in East Oakland, primarily for Mexican-American youngsters and recently opened by the Narcotics Education League. Prevention rather than cure is the operating principle here. Keep the neighborhood youngsters occupied with something other than drugs and have peer counseling available. Parents get involved at the center, planning programs and celebrations, and that makes a difference. That's not what happens in many of the other programs. I would like more parents' participation in the things that we are doing. I have constantly been asking them to come out, and none of them give me a reason why they won't come. Bill Evans would like parents to help in his own private drug prevention program for children in his East Oakland neighborhood. Evans is a businessman who owns a cafe and nightclub on East 14th Street. His own tragic experience with drugs convinced him he had to do something for the kids. Fifteen years ago, his 15-year-old daughter was killed when his former wife had an argument with a boyfriend. So she raised a pistol at the fire, and my daughter stepped in front of the fella, and she shot, and shot my daughter in the head. That's heavy. 
And later on, I found out that, you know, she was high off of drugs and stuff like this and so So Evans started meeting with kids, talking with them privately and in groups, finding work for them to do to clean up the neighborhood, sponsoring barbecues and beauty pageants, and proving to them that he cared. Is that anyone in the group has dated someone that you know was on drugs? What did you do when you found out about it? I wanted to stay with him, but um, my mother, she didn't like it. He was using it and selling, and it, he was a bad influence on me, and I didn't touch it or nothing, but then, I didn't know what else to do. I just left him alone. He in jail now for six years. He tried at first to work with social service agencies, but he found the bureaucracy frustrating. But when you have to go to this person, they have to go to their superior, and that superior had to get an okay. Well, it's by that by the time we get down to the kid, the kid is a little disgusted, and probably grown up. <laughs> In a year and a half, attendance at his meetings has climbed. Sometimes he gets a hundred kids or more. And Evan sees positive results for the kids and for him. I become a more productive citizen by listening to these kids. They tell me things that I, I couldn't get out of a book. They have so much to give. Even Mr. B is amazed by what he sees around him. For drugs are everywhere in this land, from suburbia to fashionable city neighborhoods. But nowhere are they so pervasive. Nowhere do they determine the quality of life so absolutely as in poor minority neighborhoods. Efforts to change that are largely piecemeal and uncoordinated. It will take something more, a full-scale assault that gets at causes, not just symptoms, to change the lives of youngsters like John. Ten to five years from now, I wouldn't mind but, uh, being a respectable citizen in the community holding a nice job, having a family, you know. But I know that's not going to happen because I really can't, you know, predict the future. I can just, you know, live it day by day. You know?